Well, it's nice to be here again. Tonight we're going to talk about without me, you can do nothing. I want to take you back to the time when Jesus walked upon this earth. As he went from town to town, people were uplifted. Thousands came to listen to what he had to say. And as he passed through the little towns, there was not one person left in that town that wasn't healed of whatever infirmity they had. He always had an encouraging word. He always lifted people up. He never put people down. He rebuked hypocrisy. But he was the most beautiful character that ever walked this earth. He's the only one that wouldn't run when the lepers came. And he would touch the leper and the leper would be healed. He didn't expect thanks, but he healed them anyway. The story of the ten lepers, only one came to say thank you. He raised the dead. He healed all the infirmities. He cleansed the minds. He chased away the demons and never had such a man walked this earth. Never had anyone heard such eloquence from anyone's lips prior to this in any time of history. And they nailed him to a tree. Now, let that run through your mind. The kindest gentlest person that ever walked this planet and they nailed him to a cross. Do you think it's going to be any different when it comes to the second coming of Christ in a spiritual sense? Do you think people will be prepared to accept him? If they rejected him the first time when he was physically walking amongst them, manifesting the character of God, how much more so after another 2,000 years of sin? You know, the Bible says that the solution to the problem is repentance. Ezekiel 14 verse 6 says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. And in Matthew chapter 3 verse 2, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Luke says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then Peter said unto them in Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now this little word, repent. You know, when we think of repent today, we think of sackcloth and ashes, because... That's the idea that has been infused into the mindset of men. But the word repent means a lot more than just that. The word is metanoe, and it means to think differently, to reconsider. It means a change of mind. It means adopting a new paradigm. The world has put us into a category and has made us think the way we think. And to repent means to turn around and to think differently. So salvation always starts with the mind. It always starts with the mind. It's not for nothing that the Lord put the head on top. Because this is the filter through which everything has to go. But the definition of salvation is not just to think differently. It's not any of any value to 
replace one set of paradigms with another set of paradigms. So before I went to church on a Sunday, before I used to do this, that, and the other, I used to smoke, drink, do whatever the world does, and now I think differently, and I go to church on a Sabbath, and I don't smoke, drink, and do all the other things. Has that saved me? Or are there many people out there that for no religious reason whatsoever don't smoke, drink, and do whatever? Just because they have this mindset, does this mean that they are in a salvation relationship with God? No. So salvation is a battle for the mind applied to the heart. And not the other way around. It's a battle for the mind applied to the heart. And then we have to totally reconsider our world. And salvation comes at a price. It comes at a heavy price, although it's free. We read in Isaiah 55 verse 1 where it says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that has no money, come ye buy and eat ye. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. But you have to buy it. You buy it without money. And you buy wine, which is doctrine, and milk, that's the word, the word. You internalize a new mindset. Now, if you go to the Hebrew system, the ceremonial law, you had to pay for it. Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague amongst you, when thou numberest them. This shalt thou give, every one that passes among them that is numbered half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary, half a shekel shall be the offering to the Lord. You've got to pay for the ransom of your soul. Verse 14 says, Everyone that passes among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for their souls. So everybody gave exactly the same amount. And this half a shekel... Parts of this money that came in from these half shekels was melted down and the foundations of the pillars for the sanctuary were cast out of that. So here stood God's people in this temple as pillars because the New Testament tells us that if we overcome, we shall be pillars in the house of the Lord standing on a foundation of salvation, that half a shekel. And everyone had to pay the same. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for their soul. So it was also for the service of the tabernacle. So it stood for the foundation, the price paid for the salvation, and it stood for the service. That means it stood for the continuing process of bringing this message of salvation to the entire world. Psalms 49 verse 6 says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches they won't be able to afford this. And then it says in verse 7, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. There's nothing that you can pay God that will atone for your sin, and yet you have to pay for it. 
Verse 8 says, For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. Now, if you, if you read that verse, it, it doesn't make much sense, does it? For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. So I had a look in a few other translations, and as per usual, the German translation seems to sum it up. It says there, Für das Leben ist jeder Kaufpreis zu hoch. Man muss für immer darauf verzichten. Now that's a beautiful translation. <laughs> and what it really says is, for your life, every price is too high. You can't afford it. Talking about eternal issues, of course. You must forever refrain from even considering trying to reach that price. It's impossible. You cannot, you cannot have sufficient to pay for this. It's impossible. You cannot. So it is a very precious gift. And the Bible compares this gift of the gospel with a treasure hidden in a field. And the field, of course, is the word of God, and the treasure is the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. So it describes someone going out into a field and digging and finding a treasure. Now in the old days, that was customary. You hid your money, and the safest place was in the ground. Even pirates and people like that did it. And especially in the olden days, there were regime changes that took place on a regular basis. So if some new power came in and took over, you better had, had to hide your money. And so the best place was in the ground. But sometimes, of course, the people who hid it there died before they could retrieve it, and then the treasure stayed there. And so if you found this treasure in the field, you had to secure the field because there could be treasure hidden all over in that field. You didn't know what it was worth. So you went away and you sold everything you had to secure that field. And people would say that you have gone crazy. Why are you doing this? For some miserable little field out there, you're giving away your entire livelihood. But they didn't realize what the treasure was that was in it. Now, when we talk about it in a spiritual sense, you cannot perceive the treasure in this word without heavenly unction. It's impossible. It's impossible. People have studied this Bible for eons. And without the aid of the Holy Spirit, you come up with nothing but drivel. If I think of the brilliance of many a theologian on the basis of this book, having come up with the doctrine of the immortality, the doctrine of dispensationalism, all the various doctrines that are out there in the world that are not in harmony with this book show that just because you have the book doesn't mean you have the truth. It just means you have the book. When I was an evolutionist, I studied the book of Genesis. And I thought, well, this is an, an acronym. This is an allegory. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, all the begats. They're boring. And then I thought to myself, you know what? This is, this is evolution in progress. And I actually wanted to write an article on the various begats and the various races and how they came about on an evolutionary basis using the Bible and the Bible alone. My father-in-law studied the same book and came up with esoteric philosophy. The apostles were all mediums and they had visions and spoke with the dead and they had ideas which were esoterically to be discerned so you can come up with anything in this book now if you take the time of jesus 
when he was walking amongst men, were there scribes that made it their business to study this book? Nothing but study this book. And they sat at the feet of the most brilliant people of the time studying this book. Did they discern that the one to whom it pointed was walking amidst them? No, they totally missed him. They didn't recognize him. All the types and shadows were there. He was fulfilling everyone in detail. And were they tweaked in the right direction? Did God help them to find it, yes or no? When the wise men came and they followed the star, the star should have led them to Bethlehem, but it didn't. Where did it take them? It took them to Jerusalem. Why did God take those wise men and take them to Jerusalem? Why didn't he lead them straight to Bethlehem? Because he had a message for his people. And there the star left them, and now they were destitute. What came to the mind of the wise men? Surely these scribes will know what we are here for because we saw his sign in the east. So they go and knock at the temple and they say, where is he, this prince that is in this word? Who? Huh? What prince? And so the word goes round, there's a bunch of wise men looking for a prince. And Herod hears it and he gets exceedingly anxious because he's the prince and there's going to be no other prince. And so he calls the wise men and he says, what is this about a prince? I want to know where, when, how. Study the scriptures. Come and tell me. Did they? Yes, they went back to the scriptures. They gave him the details. He informed the wise men and off they went. And then they all had a dream telling them that they shouldn't go back because that deceiver was going to kill them and was going to kill that little child that was to be born. They had every opportunity. God leant over backwards to inform his people. But they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize him. They had what we in modern language would call a dynamic equivalent interpretation of the scriptures. They had filtered it through their mind and came up with something which was the exact opposite of what they were supposed to perceive. So the word was buried in a pile of traditions which took the place of the word of God. And it is their own action, their own character, their own aspiration that made it incomprehensible to them. It was their mindset that refused to accept the word of God. Now this is a very important issue. So if salvation is a battle for the mind then we must never underestimate the enemy. Because if Christ were, was in their very midst, they didn't see him because he had instilled a mindset in them. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 They are spiritually discerned and they are foolishness to the world out there. You cannot perceive that which cuts across your selfishness. You cannot perceive it. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, 
who is the image of God, should shine upon them. 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 3 and 4. The God of this world has blinded their minds. Hmm, turn that around in your minds. 2,000 years of practice later and perfection. Do you think it's possible for the God of this world to blind the minds of this generation in which we are living? I am afraid that that is a very distinct possibility. You see, the value of this treasure cannot be measured unless it is spiritually discerned. And even then we cannot measure it. We can catch a little glimpse of it, but we cannot compare it with anything that we see or know of. And Job says, the depth says it is not in me. And the sea says it's not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. It is incomprehensible what this means. And in order to attain it, I must allow God to speak to my heart, which means my heart must first be softened by repentance, change of mind, thinking from a totally different perspective. I always like to compare it with my mindset before I became a Christian. I was an evolutionist. Everybody knows that by now. It's boring to some already. But I'll say it again. I was an evolutionist. My mindset was evolution. And it took a mega effort to turn it around. And today, my mindset is the exact opposite of what it used to be. But it took so much effort, it took so much pain, it took so many tears, not for anything in the world would I want to repeat it. But I certainly wouldn't go back to it because today my previous mindset is foolishness compared with my present mindset. Now can you imagine how I feel when I see my previous mindset come into my church like a flood. Can you see that it, that it would pain you? Now, not only in terms of evolution, but I also had an esoteric mindset. And if I see the same things happening in my church, can you imagine what pain that causes? And that you can say, ah, why don't they see it? What's the matter with them? This is such a precious mindset that we have. A gift, an immeasurable gift from God. And to throw it down the tube for potash is incomprehensible to someone who has the new mindset. So what is the problem? I believe that we are trapped by the God of this world. Nahum chapter 3 verse 10 says, Yet was she carried away. Yet was she carried away. We could say, in spite of everything that God has done, she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of the streets. And they cost lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound in chains. This is a tremendous verse. All her great men were bound in chains. 
These are obviously chains of mindset. People's minds have been toyed with. People's minds have been manipulated. And if I look at the world today, I see so many things of demonic devising that it frightens me. And I see young people and they have all kinds of ailments, mental ailments, addictions to what the world has to offer. The only exercise some people get today is two thumbs. And they're the best exercise thumbs in the whole history of mankind. I can't even move them as fast as some of them can. How many people today are on antidepressants? Why? Because they cannot cope with what has been dished up to them. Because the God of this world has changed the mindset of man and twisted it around and distorted it and destroyed it. I want to quote from a book here a few interesting things. The Council of Trent. Once the Council of Trent had established that Roman Catholicism wasn't going to change, Europe had to be changed back to the mindset of the pre-Reformation times. And for this, the society of Jesus was brought to life with the one object of putting reason against reason. So what was it a battle for? When they couldn't win the battle on the battlefield with a sword, the battle had to change to another level. It became a battle for the mind. It's a game of chess. And the pawn in the game is me and you. And who's going to manipulate the pawn? The Society of Jesus immediately set out to set themselves up as the great educators. If you're going to battle for the mind, you better become the great educator. And so Jesuit colleges sprang up all over Europe and eventually across the waters in the New World. Everywhere there was learning against learning. Now Protestant morality and Protestant wisdom had discovered a treasure in this book. And this treasure had changed the mind. And when you receive this treasure, then the rubbish of tradition becomes meaningless. And so the battle was on. And many Protestant families eventually started sending their children to these schools because these schools were known for their excellence in education. And out of these schools eventually developed the university systems. The curriculum of the Jesuit colleges came to be adopted to a great extent as the basis of the curricula in the European colleges. Generally, wrote Dr. James J. Walsh, Dean of Fordham University. It's Jesuit education that became the norm. Mind against mind, reason against reason, knowledge against knowledge. Embedded in the ratio studorium were the elements of entertainment, of dramatic production, composition, rhetoric, eloquence, debate. These courses interlinked with the spiritual exercises brought the students to an intensity of mind against mind that had never before 
been experienced on this planet. Between 1597 and 1773, more than 500 Jesuit theatricals were staged in the Lower Rhine region in Germany alone. Queen Elizabeth at that stage had kept the Jesuits out, so they were working in Europe. They were working in the Rhineland. They were working in Bavaria. They had their great theatrical performances right there in Munich. And on one such performance in 1609, a full 14 persons of the highest rank of the Bavarian court were so enthralled by the theatrical productions that were put on that they joined Jesuitical retreats and were trained in the spiritual exercises and left Protestantism. And the Jesuits boasted, a hundred sermons couldn't have achieved what one theatrical performance had achieved. And so the great dramas where they brought the celestial gods in, Jupiter sending Saturn, marriage to Astraea, to go and fight against the evil forces. And so in all of these allegories, the great battle for the mind took place. Now in England, where they were forbidden, they had to make use of clandestine methods. And there was one man in particular that was very useful, and that man was William Shakespeare. Now, William Shakespeare is accredited, of course, with all the great literature that he has written, but his literature is so steeped in the knowledge of the Medici, the occult knowledges, if you take plays like Macbeth, for example, and all the great allegories of the battle between good and evil that are locked into those plays that take the mind by storm attracted all these people. In some of his plays, the Jesuits were actually ridiculed. For example, the gunpowder plot and all of these issues were in these tragedies that were performed. But as a consequence they actually gained, because in a battle of mind upon mind, it's fascinating what can happen. You know, people say that the English language owes its, its beauty and its great vocabulary to the great thinkers such as William Shakespeare. That's not the case. They owe their great language to this book. Because Tyndall is the one who translated this book and took all those strange nuances and sayings and dialects and put them together in the most magnificent way to create, as it were, a vocabulary and colloquial sayings which are used to this very day. And whenever the Bible was translated, there was a boom in understanding and knowledge and literacy. When the morning star of the Reformation, when he translated the Bible for the first time into the English tongue using the Vulgate, there was also a great explosion in the English language and it was followed by the world as well. The great writings of Chaucer came in that time, but when Tyndall translated this book, then the great works of William Shakespeare came in. But William Shakespeare didn't use the Bible. And his knowledge of the occult and the secret knowledge of what went before is absolutely a phenomenal and it captivated the mind. And there was a battle always between good and evil. But the players were humanists. By their great power, they achieved the victory. Does something come to mind? Do we have similar things happening today? I believe so. And then, having such great success with their theatrics, 
Rome put on the most spectacular display of its power that had been displayed for centuries, that had not been displayed for centuries, when they canonized Ignatius Loyola. And the world sat up and again took note. And these plays that were being enacted and the boom of the opera and people in their millions streaming to these plays and to the opera performances, did they have their mind focused on the word of God? Or was it taken away from it? Surely it was twisted around in a totally new direction. And then a Jesuit priest by the name of Athanasius Kircher developed an instrument which made it possible to speak to hosts of people. It was called a megaphone, a megaphone, a Jesuit priest. And this was used in the theatrics. And this was so successful that he developed another instrument which was called Laterna Magica, the magic lantern. And by means of a lens and a sharp light, he could put flickering images on the screen and there would be images behind their theatrical performances of fire and all kinds of things which kept Activated the mind. The battle for the mind was on, but it didn't lead to anything scriptural. It took away from the scriptural. And then another Jesuit was involved in bringing the cattle industry to the United States of America, and his name was Eusebio Kino. And this was a marvelous instrument. And eventually, the cowboy became an emblem in the United States. And the first movies ever made using the very technology that had been developed by the Jesuits and had been expanded by others and perfected produced the first movie theatrical performances in the world. Now his name, his surname was Kino. Now in German, the movie theater is a Kino. It's a Kino. And so this great business started. And a new morality was being infused because the cowboy chose to bring his justice according to his own morality. And people were strung up or left to live according to the morality that was developed by the actors and not by a higher power than God. So the whole theater business had been started by this precise thing. Propaganda. How to bring the mind to think in a new direction. They perfected it in Nazi Germany, where Himmler, whom Adolf Hitler called our Ignatius Loyola, was responsible for the Nazi propaganda machine. And the mindset of a whole nation was twisted. We must not underestimate this wily foe. After World War II, during September 1957, Pope John XXIII gave Jesuit theatre even broader horizons with his encyclical Miranda Prosos. I'd like to point out that Pope John XXIII is the very Pope who started Vatican II, which opened the way for the whole world to be incorporated into this New openness, this oikomene, the whole inhabited world. And he wrote in his encyclical, Men must be brought into closer communion with one another. They must become socially minded. These technical arts, cinema, sound broadcasting and television, 
can achieve this aim far more easily than the printed word. The Catholic Church is keenly desirous that these means be converted to the spreading and advancement of everything that can be truly good, called good, embracing as she does the whole of human society within the orbit of her divinely appointed mission. She is directly concerned with the fostering of civilization amongst people. So the theater had moved from the Jesuit theaters and the operas and all that went along with them, plus the millions that were gathered at these occasions and was put into the world of theater. And Hollywood was the result. You all know that Hollywood is the same wood that is used by a witch for divining. There's not, no coincidence in that matter. So the Catholic film producers and directors, Miranda Prozos, delivered a paternal injunction not to allow films to be made which are at variance with the Christian and moral standards as proposed by that great church. You see, it always surprised me that whenever you watch a movie, whether it is a good one or a bad one, whether it is a violent movie or a gentle one, there is always a Catholic priest in it somewhere. And always a Catholic church in it somewhere. Or a happy singing nun in it somewhere. Bringing a sound of music to the world. Is that a battle for the mind, yes or no? Because everybody walks out of those theatres enthused with these ideas. And that which was the enemy has suddenly become a dear friend. Pope Paul VI, in his Inter Merifica, wrote the following. It is the church's birthright to use and own. Take note. This is Pope Paul VI. This is the very Pope that finished Vatican II. That concluded it with a whole new mindset for mankind. It is the church's birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, the radio, television, and others of like nature. I'm reading their encyclicals. I'm not making this up. It is the church's birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, the radio, television, and others of like nature. Today we are experiencing an enormous dumbing down of humanity. Did you know that when universities were first started, courses in literature, history, and mathematics were compulsory before you could do any other course? Today, no university has them as compulsory. You can go and do needlework at the university, you can specialize in your special little field. But as long as the church is not involved and Christian morality doesn't come into the game, that is fine. Now when he says all these industries, well that include the games industry, the mega games industry in the world out there, which gives the thumb so much exercise. What kind of morality is preached in that? The power comes from where? The power always comes from within. And there's always a bad guy and a good guy. And the morality that determines which is which is one which is humanistic. It's not one that comes from outside. This is a battle for the mind. The press the television, 
the propaganda machinery of the world. It is the church's birthright to control them and to own them. It comes out of the mouth of the Pope of Vatican II. Is it essential to know what I am watching? Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 And they came over into the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And who has come out of the ship immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This man walks amongst the dead who had his dwelling amongst the tombs. I would like to propose that mankind today is living among the tombs. We are living amongst the dead, spiritually speaking. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Do we have a society today that seems untamable? I think we do. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. We have thousands and millions of young people who find nothing in this world to live for, who constantly cut themselves, who do not know what to do with their lives anymore because of the emptiness and then the good news, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Was it him screaming or someone else inside of him screaming? Why was this one inside of him screaming? Because he ran to Jesus. He had one object in mind, and that was Jesus. If I want to get from my state of death here amongst the tombs, this living dead state, where my mind has been twisted beyond recognition, I have to get rid of this demon inside of me. And the only way to get rid of it is to run to Jesus. And he ran and he worshipped him. But he couldn't even say it. The demon spoke for him. And Jesus doesn't address him. He addresses the demon. For he said unto him, Come out of that man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountain a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and they entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And then those that fed the swine freaked. And they ran. And they told the others what had happened. They ran. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus, the people of the city, to see him that was possessed with a devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. 
And this man who had been cleansed of this demon said, I want to follow you. But Jesus had another idea. And when he came come into the ship, he had had him possessed with the devil, prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and has had compassion on thee. Why did he send them into the swine? There's a spiritual lesson to that. Do devils have to live in something in order to survive? Do they have to live in some human being or some animal or something? Surely not. Surely not. In any case, if that's the case, they didn't have long because those swine were dead just thereafter. Those swine are a symbol of what is unclean. The unclean belongs to the unclean. But if you have been cleansed and you have a straight mind, then don't mingle with the unclean. Because the unclean is dead to you. It will rush over the cliff and it will be destroyed. Don't mingle with the unclean. The man says, I want to follow you. He says, no, go back and be a witness. These people all said to him, go away. They had the scriptures too, these people. But they were farming with swine, 2,000 of them. And I think this man turned them round because when Jesus went back there, at the later stage, there was a great harvest. A great harvest. What is the spiritual lesson for us? We are in this world, but we are not to be of this world. We are to be a witness to the world, but we are not to be partakers of the world. Unclean belongs to unclean. And that which has been cleansed and is in a right state of mind can bring many and turn many to righteousness. But don't go back to the unclean. Don't mingle with the pigs. So what does that tell us about the theater? What does that tell us about what we watch? Do you know what the definition in the old dictionaries of hypnosis is? A flickering light in a darkened room. You ever sat in a theater and watched a flickering light in a darkened room? Be careful what goes into the mind. Now Jesus took his disciples onto the Mount of Transfiguration, but he only took three. Andrew, James, and John, or was it Jude? And there he was, it was Peter, James, and John. He took them up onto the mountain. The other disciples stayed behind. And they were jealous. And while they were behind thinking, what are these goody-goody three shoes, two shoes doing up there with Jesus? A man came up to them and said, I have this boy who has a demon. And they tried to drive this demon out. Matthew 17, verse 14. And when they came to the multitudes, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Jesus has come down from this Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. Excuse me, do you think he's talking to this man? This poor man has come there, he's desperate, he brings his child, who throws himself into the fire, drowns himself, his life is a total misery. And Jesus would say to him, You perverse and wicked generation? I don't think so. I think he was addressing someone else. 
O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and they said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain as mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence and yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Albeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Oh, we say. So the demon that had hold of this young boy, he took his morning oats, And he went to the gym regularly. This was a tough, powerful demon. Can't chuck a demon like that out without, you know, fasting and prayer. Because some demons are just so strong you can't move them. Excuse me, do we get rid of the demons or does the Lord Jesus get rid of the demons? So is there a demon, demon that's so powerful that even the Lord Jesus has to go to the gym to cast him out? Do you think so? No. The problem doesn't lie with the power of the demon. The problem lies with the weakness of men. Why could they not cast them out? Because of their hypocrisy. Because of the jealousy in their heart. Because they thought they had this power. But who needed the fasting and prayer? The demon or they? They needed the fasting and prayer. This kind won't go out. You won't throw a demon out if your heart is not right with God. If your heart is not right with God, you can pray till the cows come home. You won't get rid of a demon. And in order to get rid of him, you have to have faith. Faith as a mustard seed. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus. So, If the modern mega preachers strut up and down like peacocks commanding the demons to come out. Do you think those demons go or are they playing a game? They're playing a game. Because it is only if we deny self, only if we accept our total Total helplessness. Only if by repentance and changed mindset we accept that the power does not lie with us but lies with God that we can overcome in this time in which we are living right now. We are living in the most serious time in the history of mankind. This is the moment of final decision. This is the moment just before Armageddon. This is the moment of the final judgment. We dare not trust in self. We dare not be puffed up. It is in simplicity that we will find true godliness. Because without him I can do nothing. It's a very interesting statement. Trust not in self, but trust in God. This is the measure by which we are judged in the sight of heaven. That's really a powerful statement. Trust not in self, trust in God. This is the measure whereby we are judged. What mindset do we have? That I, as a human being, have some inherent power within me, some magic formula, some potent words, almost like a spell, which can make any demon run for cover? Or does my power lie in the exact opposite mindset? What's our choice? This is the battle for the mind. And I am afraid to say 
that Jesuitical theater is currently winning the battle because we need a word-based faith. We need a faith that doesn't lie within our capability. It is a capability that can only be given to us as a gift from God. The prayer of Christ for his disciple was, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If we are to be sanctified through a knowledge of the truth found in the word, we must have an intelligent knowledge of his will therein. So it starts with the mind. I need an intelligent knowledge. But if that knowledge, that intelligent knowledge, is not implied to the heart, then self will get in the way. And I will be puffed up and I will try to fight this battle alone. Why is it that we are so weak? Why is it that we have to go at this time in history and say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, why could I not cast him out? Or why can we as a church not do it? Why do we have to go and say, why can we not cast him out? It is because your mind has been taken captive and you think like the enemy. You need a total rethink. We have the examples of Enoch, we have the examples of Abel, we have the examples of Moses, we have the example of David, we have the example of the prophets. But it helps us nothing if we do not apply the lessons to the heart. Because the final issue is character. Character. Because that's the only thing we'll take to heaven. When the Lord Jesus says, you are my friends if you do as I say. When he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Is he being dictatorial? Is he being dictatorial? Or is he asking for a change of mind? Is he asking me to accept that I am but dust? I am but a created being. I don't have the capacity to be what Satan wants to be. I cannot lift up myself to the level of God. I am a created being. The only power that I have is a power that is imparted and imputed to me from a higher source, and that is God. As soon as self comes in the way, I cannot win this battle. Because I have no power. Without him, I can do nothing. Now that doesn't make me a slave if I understand that the mindset of God is the mindset that sets me free from bondage rather than putting me into bondage. And so I need to rethink I don't keep the commandments because I have to. The very words of Jesus defy it. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It is a compulsion of love from the heart. Unselfish agape love. <clears throat> what does love require? If it is unselfish love, what does it require? Sacrifice, yes. Remember when you first became Christians and you discovered the saving grace of, of God. What was the first impulse in the mind? Oh goody, now I'm saved. Thank heaven, that's done, I can get on with my life. Or was the first impulse... What about my father? What about my mother? What about my wife? What about my children? What about my friends? Am I right? That was the first impulse. Now that was the first impulse. That impulse was dictated by love. Because love never seeks self. Love always seeks someone else. 
And the first impulse was, I have to warn my friends. This is a serious issue. They could be lost forever. I'm talking about a mindset. Conviction of the heart. The first impulse is, I have to warn others. Love dictates it. And then Satan comes with his brilliant little schemes and he says eventually to you, don't worry so much about the others. Are you really saved? Do you really have an experience with God? Do you know that it is his voice that is talking to you? How do you know that you are on the right path? How do you know that you are not self-deceived? Do you have a relationship? Come, let me teach you how to get this relationship. Come, I will show you what it is like to be in perfect communication with God so that you can feel his power flowing through you. And then you will know that you have a living relationship. Let me give you a formation and I will form you. And you belong to a Christian college, even an Adventist college, They won't teach you the ways of the world. Don't worry, it won't be esoteric. It won't be new age. There will be no mantra. But we will teach you what you must do and how you must become to be spiritually formed. Now, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being very serious. Because spiritual formation in good Christian colleges goes along that track. And of course you have to study the way that the others do it too, so let's study how they do it. And we see, oh, this saint did it this way and Ignatius Loyola did it that way. We have to avoid that. We have to go this way And we have to watch that way. We don't want to do it like that. We want to do it like this. We want to stay in the right principles. But where is this heading? If you take the overall picture, who does all of this revolve around? Self. Am I right with God? Have I got the right formula? Have I got the right fruits? Have I got the right this? Do I have a communication? Do I hear the voice of God? Do What's the common word in all those sentences? I. I. If we want to be Christians, and if we want to be Christians at all, we must have a burning desire to save others, even if it costs our life. And so the burden of the message to come before the people at this time is the three angels' messages. Preach the three angels' messages. Preach the three angels' messages. Preach the three angels' messages. You are to allow nothing else to occupy the mind. Where is the burden now? It's with others. And that is the point. The other methodology focuses on self and the other methodology tries not to offend anybody because it is not good Christian formation to be offensive. You have to be kind and gentle and long-suffering which are all good Christian virtues. But believe me, if you go out and you do what God requires you to do, if you go out and you preach this message to the world and you bring the message faithfully, 
God will use even the blows that come back in your direction to form your character. He'll do it. And it will not be because you have struggled to find a relationship with him, but because you are doing what the word of God asked you to do in the first place. And that is a formation that you cannot receive on the desk of any university. That is an education that you can only receive in the University of Hard Knocks. And so, we are admonished. The truths are not to be hoarded. The truths are to be shared. It might be a hidden treasure, but when you have found the treasure which you have bought without price, which is priceless, but which cost you everything you ever had and everything you ever thought and everything that you ever were because it has twisted your mind around in the opposite direction, then there is nothing other in your mind than to help others to find it too. And we can only do that by preaching to the outside world. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Nothing. I cannot preach the gospel without him. I cannot. It would be a lame, senseless exercise. I can be the most uneducated, simplest human being on the face of the earth, or I could be the most educated on the face of the earth. Without him, I can do nothing. The most simplest, stuttering individual becomes eloquence in his hand. Not necessarily by what comes out of his mouth, but by what is communicated by the Spirit. God wants to use every single one of us. And this concentration on self and self-sufficiency and this constant asking whether I'm in the right communication, whether I have the right technique, whether I have the right this or the right that or the right other is all steeped in I. The Savior knew that no argument, however logical, would melt hard hearts or break through the crust of worldliness and selfishness. He knew that his disciples must receive the heavenly endowment, that the gospel would be effective only as it was proclaimed by hearts, proclaimed by hearts, made warm and lips made eloquent by a living knowledge of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Our message is not to become tail-biting Christians who constantly turn around themselves within themselves and among themselves to find their fulfillment in God. The only way you can find fulfillment in God is to have the mindset of God. And if he came to die so that no one should be lost, what should our mission be? We must not allow the mission of this church to be changed into a self-seeking gospel. It may not happen because who is going to warn the world then? We have a mission. We have a particular mission. And whoever exalts himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Do what the Lord says. For the Lord gives wisdom out of the mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. In a world like ours, where truth and falsehood are so closely mingled that it is difficult to discern between them, it is a perilous matter to neglect to seek wisdom from on high. The only safe course is to do what he said. If you are my disciples, you will do what I told you. And what is the commission of this church? To go and preach the three angels' messages. Nothing else is allowed to come between us and that message. Anything that 
no matter how spiritual or how beautiful it looks, that comes between us and that message, is a message of self. Do I say this or don't I? I do. Do I need a coach? Do I need a spiritual advisor to tell me which way to walk and which way not to walk? What is man that I should be mindful of him? I need no coach. I need God. And I need friends. And friends won't coach. Friends will give good advice at the right time. And yes, it is right to associate with one another. And it is right to seek counsel from those who are trustworthy in the ways of the gospel. But to take a coach is to lean upon the arm of flesh. It should never happen in our midst. The greatest coach that ever walked the planet is not dead today. There is still a God in Israel and he still rules, and I still have access to him. Behold, for peace I have had great bitterness, says Isaiah chapter 38, verse 17. But thou hast in love to my soul, deliver it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Would you want to read that again? Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For me to go groveling around, trying to reach perfection, that will satisfy God in any sense is ludicrousy. Amen. By faith, I accept that Jesus has paid the price for me. And by faith, I will accept that he will empower me to fulfill the commission that he has given me and everyone else in this church. And by faith, in the word of God, this war is, thought, is fought, and let no one rob you of your treasure. Amen.